So my name is Matt Corda. Um, I'm a research associate for the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Um, so my job is to uh, help provide the public with analysis about um, the global nuclear arsenals of all nine nuclear armed states. I kind of have a, a bit of a circuitous um, route here. I uh, European studies and, and um, a special kind of focus on uh, genocide studies and, and the Second World War. And um, that kind of naturally led me into the, the end of that war. And then I kind of stumbled across this, this book uh, by John Hersey called Hiroshima, which is this pretty horrifying account of basically documenting what, what happened when the United States bombed Hiroshima with the, the first ever use of an atomic bomb in, in wartime. And I was immediately really fascinated and, and terrified and uh, really intrigued. And I just, I wanted to learn everything I could about it. That's kind of the lens through which I, I started learning about nuclear weapons and um, the lens through which I've, I've approached my work. Really when you, you know, read some of the, the passages of Hersey's findings, it's just, it's just like incomprehensible, right? The, the, the amount of destruction that even a relatively small nuclear weapon can, can accomplish, right? So that, you know, the bomb that was dropped there was, you know, somewhere between 15 and, and 20 kilotons is kind of the, the, the accepted measurement. And today we're working with, with nuclear weapons that are, you know, an order of magnitude larger, um, right? So the, the amount of destruction that we would see by even just one of those bombs going off is just, it's like it's it's so impossible to even to even think about. Uh, the nine nuclear states are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So that's the United States, China, Russia, France, and the United Kingdom, plus um, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. So no North Korea is a bit of a a tough one because um, there's so much that we don't we don't know about you know the the types of warheads that they're producing or things like that. But what we do know is that um, certainly there is the the capability today to produce um, bombs, you know, in, in pretty much every nuclear armed country um, that are basically an order of magnitude larger than the bombs, you know, first used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the 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 weapons that we're dealing with today are are significantly larger. We still have um, still have approximately 400 ICBMs that are. Uh, deployed in in and are on alert in silos across the Midwest, in um, Colorado, Montana, uh, Nebraska, North Dakota, and, and Wyoming. Um, there was a, a significant downsizing, certainly in um, in the kind of the global nuclear arsenal, and, and in the United States in particular. You know, there was a, a push throughout a, several administrations to kind of reduce the role of nuclear weapons. That trend has um, over the past call it the past decade or so, maybe maybe a little bit less, um, that, you know, over, over the past several years, that trend has has really stopped and, and reversed. And now really what we're seeing, which is quite um, disturbing, is that every single nuclear armed state, um, including the United States, is modernizing their, their nuclear weapons arsenals. And uh, we are seeing that, you know, in some cases, countries are replacing their older legacy systems with you know, brand new systems. Um, in other cases, they are literally increasing the numbers of nuclear weapons that they have in their stockpile, um, the numbers of missiles that they have, those those kinds of things. So it's a it's a, a dangerous trend, certainly. So on this graph, you know, we kind of hit the peak of global nuclear arsenals in the you know in the the mid 1980s with approximately 70,000 warheads, um, most of which are are in the United States and and the Soviet Union. And then that number really like trickles down over time, and especially after the Cold War kind of comes to an end, there are a, a bunch of um, nuclear initiatives and, and uh, arms control agreements that lower that number substantially. And we get to um, you know somewhere in the realm of what we have today, which is the United States and Russia both possessing you know approximately six thousand nuclear weapons in their inventories each. And you know the number that is actually like deployed is is lower than that because some of those are are um, meant to be retired. One of the things that I that I address in my report is that 
there are a lot of inherent problems with ICBMs. There's some pretty significant and, and destabilizing aspects that come with ICBMs in general. So, so the first of these is that ICBMs invite a really devastating attack on, on US soil, right? So um, I feel like sometimes when we get into the weeds of, of you know, like abstract deterrence theory, we, we kind of forget or we, we lose perspective on what it would actually mean for an adversary to launch several hundred warheads and, and attack the US ICBM force. And what it really means is that, you know, it, it would be nothing short of basically the, the complete collapse of American society and, and the American state as we know it. Right. So um, you know, sometimes we've heard arguments in the past that ICBMs can somehow save lives because they're they're deployed kind of in the middle of the country in these in these sparsely populated areas. But you know, r realistically, we know from the accounts at Hiroshima um, that the bombing there destroyed over 80% of all hospitals in the city, right? Today's bombs, I, I mentioned, are, are an order of magnitude larger, right? So the, you know, the, the privatized American healthcare system is already um, uniquely strained on a, on a regular basis. And in the event of a, of a nuclear attack, we would see it basically completely disintegrate. And also the states where ICBMs are deployed which also then kind of constitute ground zero for a, for a nuclear attack. Those states also happen to produce basically half of um, the entire country's caloric intake, right? So you have, um, you would likely have national and, and regional food shortages. You would uh, have huge disruption to key industries like um, energy and, and manufacturing and banking and transportation. You'd have all this population displacement and, and nowhere for people to go. And I think on top of that, you would have a lot of damage that is not even limited to the United States because um, the detonation of several hundred warheads, even if they're on U.S. soil, would create, you know, these these smoke clouds the size of of entire continents, right? We we we'd have um, precipitation decreases for for somewhere up to a decade, right? We could see a a huge global famine, right? So there's a lot of kind of social and economic and and environmental factors to consider, but I think the the main takeaway from this particular point is that ICBMs are not life-saving tools, right? They are basically a giant target in the middle of the country um, that invite a really devastating attack. Uh, and, and we would basically never recover from it, right? So I think that's kind of the, the first way in which ICBMs are, are, are inherently really problematic. The second one is that um, ICBMs have very significant limitations in addressing 21st century deterrence challenges, right? So the, the way that they're deployed, the flight paths would force them to overfly Russian territory on their way to targets in China, North Korea, Iran, right? So this places really significant constraints on the conditions under which they would actually be used, right? So meaning that there are other weapons in the US nuclear arsenal that are better suited for those kinds of deterrence missions than ICBMs, and they don't come with those overflight risks. So um, their their utility is actually pretty limited in a in a 21st century setting. And the third major problem with ICBMs, and I think the probably the most important one, is that they can bias a president towards launching nuclear weapons very quickly in a crisis. And this has been you know pretty openly acknowledged by um, some former commanders of U.S. Strategic Command former secretaries of defense, and they suggest that the ICBM force is um, inherently vulnerable by the fact that they have these known fixed locations that can be seen from space, right? And they can be um, easily targeted in a first strike. And that means that in the event of a, of a false alarm, which are uh, more common than you might think actually, right? In the 1970s, 1980s, we were averaging somewhere like three moderately serious false alarms per week. Right, so in the event of a, of a first strike or a false alarm, a president would have only like a few minutes to decide whether or not to launch ICBMs or not. And you know, Reagan actually wrote, he wrote about this, this dilemma in his autobiography, um, where he said, you know, six minutes to decide how to respond to like a blip on a radar screen and decide whether or not to unleash Armageddon, how can, how can anyone apply reason at a time like that? And he was right. Right, so the the other elements of, of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, right, especially things like submarines, they don't have those same kinds of time pressures because they're essentially invulnerable to a first strike, and and that's openly acknowledged by the Pentagon, right. So this means that 
you know, I, I would suggest when you kind of wrap all those different factors up, I would say that ICBMs can be described as inherently destabilizing weapon systems compared to other weapons in the US nuclear arsenal. So I mentioned that the, the United States currently has about 400 um, Minuteman III ICBMs that are, that are deployed across the Midwest. In the early 2010s, um, the Pentagon made a decision to begin a program called the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent, which effectively constitutes um, a replacement of the currently deployed force of 400 Minuteman III ICBMs um, with a brand new missile system, which they would purchase for um, a cost that's been recently estimated at about $264 billion throughout its life cycle. And this is a, a pretty significant amount of money. Um, and when you do a major acquisition program like this, the Pentagon is required to complete a process called the analysis of alternatives during which they you know, consider other possibilities besides buying this brand new set of missiles. So they also considered you know, life extending the current force instead, which um, as I kind of estimated in my report, that would be um, significantly cheaper. And ultimately the Pentagon uh, ruled out a life extension program. They decided instead to, to go forward and, and purchase this brand new missile set. And they offered a few different justifications, right? They said that um, the GBSD, it would address some kind of capability gap that currently, um, they said currently existed in the, in the force. They said it would help the industrial base. They said that it would share some kind of commonality with, with the Navy's missiles. But most importantly, they said that pursuing this new brand, new, brand new deterrent would be cheaper than the cost of life extending um, the current set of missiles. And my report finds that basically all of these assumptions that, that the Pentagon made appear to have been either flawed um, or exaggerated or since deprioritized. And they really heavily biased the Pentagon's decision to pursue GBSD instead of life extending uh, Minuteman III. There is very little public evidence to suggest that the current Minuteman III force could not be life extended at a, at a much lower cost because you know, largely the, the critical subsystems within, within those missiles, right? So the, the guidance modules, um, the propulsion, right, the boosters, they continue to show pretty high reliability with age. Um, and the Air Force has even suggested that um, the current useful life of their ICBMs could be extended with um, better, better data, right? Because they say that the current age out uh, metrics on, on things like guidance are what they call an engineering best guess. Right, so um, in my report, I kind of push back on this narrative that the that the Pentagon is using, which suggests that the current ICBM force is going to become unviable after like 2030. Right, that that's what that's what we're hearing a lot, because their own program documents suggest that those estimates are are just a best guess. Right, but importantly, even if those subsystems like the guidance and the propulsion, even if they did need to be eventually replaced, the Air Force has a really good track record of doing this for very low cost, right? So they, they did this um, first suite of life extension programs in the, in the mid 2000s, and it cost about like $7 billion to make the missiles um, in the, and to quote an Air Force analyst, to make the missiles basically new missiles except for the shell, right? So doing that, right, like when we compare, you know, $7 billion um, to the proposed $264 billion uh, needed to, you know, purchase a brand new set of missiles, right? The costs associated with life extension are significantly less risky. It's important to acknowledge, I think, that the politics that come into play when we think about, you know, why we still have ICBMs and what role politics has in the decision to pursue GBSD, right, to, to purchase these brand new missiles. And you know, during the Cold War, Midwestern politicians really advocated for bringing missiles to their districts, right? Often because those districts were pretty underfunded compared to um, other districts, right? And, and having these new missiles meant that you would get government investment into those districts. And because, you know, the missiles had a lot of needs, right? They had, um, you know, you had to have working telephone lines for communication. You had to have really paved roads, right, so they could travel. 
right? So um, politicians would, would openly ask for missiles to be brought to their district and, and for missiles to be kept around, right? Because it meant, you know, this kind of government investment. And in many ways, you know, that phenomenon has not gone away, right? So it's, it's not, not a huge surprise to see that um, politicians today are very nervous about the prospect of ICBMs leaving their district. And today, the politicians that represent those missile fields, they work together on a, on a bipartisan basis to advocate for basically the, the indefinite sustainment of their ICBM bases. And that group of lawmakers is known as the, the Senate ICBM Coalition. They're largely in the Senate. Um, they have senators from the three ICBM bases, right, in Wyoming, Montana, and, and North Dakota, plus Utah, where um, ICBM sustainment and maintenance activities take place. And over the past 15 years in particular, uh, the members of the Senate ICBM coalition have played a, a really outsized role in dictating nuclear force posture and, and occasionally even overriding the guidelines set by the Pentagon in order to prevent any kinds of significant ICBM reductions from taking place. And so I can give you an example. So during um, the, the negotiations over the New START Treaty, um, and, the, and the force posture negotiations that went into that in, you know, around 2013, the, the ICBM coalition explicitly blocked the Pentagon from conducting um, an environmental impact survey regarding like the elimination of these extra ICBM silos. And in, you know, statements that, the, that came out afterwards, the members of the ICBM coalition just specifically kind of, um, boasted about how they had overruled the Pentagon on the ICBM issue. And they said, you know, the Pentagon tried to find a way around their amendments, but then we pressured them and then they backed off, right? So actions like that have, have proved to be really, really consequential in determining U.S. nuclear force posture levels under New START, which is the levels that we're, we're currently under. And by the time that those treaties, that treaty's central limits came into effect in, in 2018, the reduction of the ICBM leg, um, which was, you know, they reduced it by about 50 missiles, was substantially smaller than the reductions in the air leg or the sea leg of the nuclear triad. And given that, you know, the Pentagon did make some attempt to um, reduce the ICBM force even further than that, but they were kind of, they were forced to back off, right, by this coalition, I think it's pretty fair to suggest that the, the disparity in reductions can be pretty directly attributed to the, the pressure put on by the ICBM coalition. It's important to note that like these, those politicians are, they are largely funded by weapons contractors and, and other corporations that, you know, stand to, to materially benefit from the GBSD program. And there was this great report that, that the Center for International Policy put out um, earlier this year, and it suggested that between 2012 and 2020, um, the major ICBM contractors contributed about, I think it was slightly over $1 million to um, the members of the Senate ICBM coalition and over $15 million to the members of Senate and House Armed Services, uh, like the Strategic Forces subcommittees, the Appropriations subcommittees, right, committees that play a really direct role in authorizing and appropriating funds for the ICBM force. And the, the concern, I think, for these politicians is that, um, you know, they often talk about jobs in their districts. But in reality, the ICBM force does not create nearly as many jobs as those advocates will claim, right? The, the costs of war project at Brown University, they've done some great work on this. And they found that for basically the same amount of spending, right, the, the same amount of, of spending that's attributed to um, defense and the military, you can get... Um, 100% more of the jobs by uh, for that money going to healthcare, right? You can get 120% more from that going to uh, education, right? And I think they said that for every, somewhere in the realm of like for every billion dollars that you shift from defense to green manufacturing, you get a, a net increase of 2,000 jobs, right? So redirecting that defense money um, towards, you know, those kinds of priorities would help, I think, you know, increase the resilience of local communities to the potential economic impacts of reducing ICBMs. And a lot, you know, analysis um, of previous military base closures or realignments 
you know, that's that has revealed that um, most military communities have actually increased their employment levels, like in many cases by like several hundred percent after those bases closed and the federal investments were reallocated towards those other priorities. Not only are we seeing, you know, nuclear arsenals um, increasing or, or improving, but it also seems that a lot of states are um, reinvigorating or, or, or you know, even expanding the role that nuclear weapons have in their military doctrine, specifically when it comes to non-strategic nuclear weapons or, or what are sometimes known as tactical nuclear weapons. And, you know, some sometimes we hear that, you know, these kinds of deployments are intended to um, prevent conflict, but, you know, regardless of, of how much confidence you put into those kinds of statements, it is just a fact that um, many states are now increasingly posturing themselves for nuclear war fighting, right? So that, that kind of development is going to make it a lot more difficult to reduce the role of nuclear weapons and, you know, pursue kind of disarmament-focused um, reductions in, in the future. Personally, I would, I would consider nuclear disarmament to be a, a pretty urgent humanitarian imperative, an environmental imperative, um, a security imperative. Something that concerns me is that nuclear armed states largely don't seem to share that same view of disarmament. Instead, most states seem to consider disarmament as a type of chore mandated by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they're all signatories to, but not really one that they're particularly interested in completing in the foreseeable future. Um, and kind of just, you know, anecdotally speaking, I, it's increasingly rare to hear any officials from nuclear armed states express a coherent rationale for pursuing disarmament other than just because they're obligated to do so under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And to my mind, that, that sort of speaks to a um, just a, a general lack of seriousness or, or interest um, or vision about, about pursuing disarmament. And something that I find um, a little disturbing as well is that it seems that many nuclear armed states are increasingly focused on shifting the responsibility for disarmament onto the non-nuclear armed states by arguing that they first have to help create the security conditions that will make nuclear disarmament possible. Despite the, 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 the reductions that have come you know, since the Cold War ended, um, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and it seems like a lot, of, a lot of the progress seems to be kind of stalling out. And so you know, the reason why I focus so much in my report on, on ICBMs is because of those um, inherent you know, kind of destabilizing dangers that come with that particular weapon system. But it does not have to stay that way, right? So as um, a lot of folks have, have suggested recently, you know, the United States could eliminate this, this requirement in its nuclear posture to pursue preemptive damage limiting nuclear strikes, right? And that's the role that ICBMs have historically fulfilled in US nuclear strategy. Doing that would prioritize the role of ballistic missile submarines, right, which is the most kind of survivable leg of the triad, to ensure that the United States could, you know, ride out a nuclear attack, accurately assess damage, and still maintain an assured retaliatory capability. This would, really importantly, expand presidential decision time from just a couple minutes to several hours, perhaps even days, right? That's that's effectively the doctrine of the United Kingdom, right, which has only four nuclear armed ballistic missile submarines. They usually deploy only one at sea. Um, and they rely on this, you know, modernized and, and kind of backstopped command and control infrastructure to make sure that they're always in communication. The United States has all of the capabilities necessary in order to make that kind of shift towards a similar kind of posture. And that would really dramatically reduce the pressure that a president is under to launch really quickly in a nuclear crisis. And ultimately, you know, the decision to revise this kind of this kind of nuclear guidance, that lies in the hands of the president, right? And revising nuclear guidance is not unusual, right? So it's it's um, believed that since the end of the Cold War, um, the war plan has been revised somewhere around like 20 times, right? So if the president wants to shift away 
from this, this kind of destabilizing posture that we're under, right? They can do that, right? And and if the president wanted to shift from, you know, this this doctrine that that currently exists to use ICBMs in this this damage limiting way, then the military requirement to maintain ICBMs as part of the U.S. nuclear arsenal that also goes away, right? So I I would suggest that really we're we're due for we are long overdue for a for a serious review of the role of the ICBMs in, in U.S. nuclear posture. And you know, despite these reductions that we've had over the past few decades, the, the Pentagon has not really offered, to my mind, a, a particularly convincing rationale for why we still have them, right? Or, or what role um, those these Cold War era weapons are supposed to play in a, in a post-Cold War security environment. <laughs>